And now we come to our study in the Word of God. I invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to John chapter 14. And today our focus is on verse 6. If you're visiting with us today, we are in a series, a short series, on the I Am statements of our Lord Jesus Christ as contained in the Gospel of John. And to this point, we have seen I am the bread of life, I am the light of the world, I am the door of the sheep, I am the good shepherd, I am the resurrection and the life. And now we come today to John 14 and verse 6, this glorious I am declaration by our Savior, who says, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. I have told you before that there are many truths in the Christian faith that are clearly taught in the Bible that are not hard to understand. They are just hard to swallow. Uh, the reason that they are hard to swallow is because they are offensive to our sinful flesh and because they react against our human sensibilities. And there are many offensive things about Christianity, at least for some people. And the chief offenses about Christianity were amazingly enough spoken by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. These offensive statements are known as the hard sayings of Christ. And I want to say again, hard, not because they're hard to understand, but because they are hard to accept. They are so counterintuitive to what we hear in the world, and they are so antithetical to fallen man's way of thinking. The passage before us is one of the hard sayings of Christ. Here Jesus says that He is the only way to heaven. Our Lord asserts here that every other religion in the world leads to eternal destruction. Now, Jesus claims in this text that He alone is the only way to the Father, and there is no ambiguity in the way that He states this. He speaks with a positive assertion and then with a negative denial. The positive assertion is, I am the way and the truth and the life. The negative denial is, no one comes to the Father but through me. To take these words at face value reveals that there is no other path, no other religion, no other means by which one may come to God nor ascend to heaven except through Jesus Christ himself. As we look at this text in John 14, this is the sixth I am statement by Jesus in the Gospel of John. The speaker is Christ himself. The place is the upper room in Jerusalem. The time is the night before his crucifixion. The audience is his small band of confused disciples. This is the final time for Jesus to address his men before returning to the Father after three years of pouring his life into them. As he has gathered in the upper room with them, he has washed their feet. He has said to them, one of them will betray him. And then in verse 33 of the previous chapter, in John 13, verse 33, Jesus said, little children, I'm with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. He makes a dramatic statement that he will now depart from them and where he goes, being separated from him, they cannot come, at least not now. Peter responds in verse 36 and said, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I go, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me later. Of course, Jesus is speaking of his death, of his resurrection, of his ascension, of his return to the Father, of his ascent into heaven to be seated at the right hand of God the Father. That is where he is going. 
He is going back to the Father. And there will be this temporal time of separation. Understandably, they are very troubled by this. Because to this point, they have literally lived in his shadow. He has been their their leader, their provider. And so at the beginning of chapter 14, verse 1, to comfort them, Jesus said, Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. What Jesus is saying, though I leave you, trust me. Put your faith in me. Trust God. This is his plan. This is his purpose. And then in verse 2, Jesus now explains where he is going. He says in verse 2, In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. Now it is clear. He is going to the Father's house in order to prepare a place for them. He says this to encourage them. In verse 3, he said, If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus is referring to his Father's house as a real place. He is representing heaven to us as a, a, a wonderful place of close, intimate fellowship and relationship of a family gathering together in a house. Now, this place is not an imaginary place. It is not a figment of their imagination. It is a real place, and Jesus is going there, and he says he will come again and bring them to where he is. In verse 4, he says, and you know the way where I'm going. That is a veiled allusion to his death, to his resurrection, and to his ascension, which he has made mention of many times to them. Thomas now in verse 5 speaks up and says, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? Implied in that question is, we want to go with you. What is the way to the Father's house. What is the way to be with you? And in response to that, Jesus says this in verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus now speaks with an authoritative assertion that he alone is the way. That is the key part of verse 6, is the way. The truth and the life really are modifiers of the way. In the previous two verses, Jesus has spoken of the way. Thomas says, we want to know the way. Jesus says, I will now tell you the way. Today, I want us to look at verse 6 and see these three statements, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and they are interconnected. And these three headings will be this, Jesus is the only way to God, Jesus is the only truth from God, and Jesus is the only life in God. Or to put it another way, Jesus is the way of reconciliation, He is the truth of revelation, and he is the life of regeneration. I want us to now dig into this extraordinary verse that it is hard to plumb the depths of it. Jesus begins in verse 6 by saying, number one, Jesus is the only way to God. When Jesus said, I am the way, he is stating this emphatically, I am the way. Jesus himself is personally the way to the Father. Religion is not the way to the Father. Ritual is not the way to the Father. Neither is good works or church or a church attendance or baptism, but Jesus Christ himself is the way to the Father. And when he says, the way, 
he is making an exclusive claim to be the one and only true way of salvation that leads from this world into the very presence of God. Notice when he says, I am the way. The way speaks of a path. Uh, The way speaks of a road or, or of a track. A way supposes two points. It supposes a beginning and a final destination. It is the path that leads from one point to the other. In this case, this way, which is the way, leads from man's total ruin and sin to the Father above who reigns in glory. Jesus claims here that there is no way to go from point A to point B apart from him. There is no way to go from this sinful world in our sinful state into the presence of an infinitely holy God except we go by the means that Jesus will provide. Now, this implies that the entire human race is separated from God. We're not with God face to face right now. We are separated from God. We need the way to God. And the reason that we are separated is because of Adam's sin and every subsequent sin that has been committed in this world. When God created Adam, he placed him in the garden, he placed him in paradise, and Adam had a close personal relationship with God. He walked with God. He talked with God. But when Adam disobeyed God, there suffered a breach in their relationship. And Adam hid from God. And God drove Adam out of the garden. And there could not be this close relationship because of sin. And the same is true in our lives as well. It is our own sin that has separated us from God in heaven. That is why there must be the way to the Father from where we find ourselves in the ruin of our own sin. And Jesus came not merely to show the way, not merely to point the way. Jesus came to actually be the way, to provide the way by his life and by his death. How has Jesus made the only way back to the Father? Two ways. Number one, by his sinless life. Where the first Adam failed by disobeying God in the garden, the second Adam, Jesus Christ, has triumphed by perfectly obeying God. Moreover, where you and I have repeatedly broken the law of God, Through our entire lives, Jesus Christ repeatedly and perfectly kept the law of God. He obeyed every nuance of the moral law of God that was given. It was by His sinless life that He has prepared a way to the Father by His own obedience. But second, also by His sin-bearing death. Not only by his sinless life, but by his sin-bearing death. And upon the cross, our sins were transferred to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he bore our sins in his body. And by his death, he reconciled us to God. We were alienated from God. We were separated from God. We were far away from God. And by the death of Christ... We have been brought near to God. This is the one and only way to God. Romans 5 verse 10 says, While we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son. And he goes on to say in verse 11, Through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have received the reconciliation. The only way that we may be brought to God is by the sinless life and the sin-bearing death of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all, the testimony born at the proper time. 
It was by this saving mission of Jesus Christ that we are brought to God. He himself is the way. Jesus said in Matthew 7 and verse 13, Enter through the narrow gate. Verse 14, For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Jesus is saying there is only one path that leads to life, and that path is faith in Him. Uh, the writer of Hebrews says, we have confidence in Hebrews 10, verse 19. We have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way. It was by the shed blood of Jesus Christ upon the cross that has opened up the only true living way into the Father. And when Jesus died... The veil in the temple was rent top to bottom, signifying that there is now access to come into the presence of God, and it is through the blood-stained cross of Jesus Christ. It is the only way by which we may come to God. The writer of Proverbs says, There is a way which seems right to a man, but the end thereof is the end of death. Proverbs 14, verse 12. Other paths may seem to be so right. They may seem to be so appealing. But every single one of them leads to destruction. There is only one way to the Father, and that is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. So real was this that the early Christians were identified as those who are on the way. You remember in Acts 9, in verse 2, Saul of Tarsus was going to Damascus to find those belonging to the way, both men and women, that they might be bound and brought back to Jerusalem. Early Christianity was identified by these two words simply, the way. Jesus was the way, and they were on the way. They were going the way. They were a part of the only way to heaven. In Acts 19, in verse 9, we read the same, that there were those who were hardening their hearts and becoming disobedient, speaking against the way. That's how you speak, how you spoke against the Christian faith in the first century. You spoke against the way. It became synonymous with knowing God and knowing Jesus Christ. The same in Acts 19, verse 23, there occurred no small disturbance concerning the way. Acts 22, verse 4, I persecuted this way to the death, Paul would say. And in Acts 24, 14, the way which they call a sect. And again in Acts 24, verse 22, again and again and again throughout the book of Acts, the believers were referred to as those who were on the way because they were so identified with Jesus Christ who claimed to be the way. I want to ask you, are you on the way? I'm not asking you, are you in church? I'm not asking you, are you a part of a Christian family? I'm not asking you... Are you a part of a nation in which Christianity has been observed? I am asking you, are you personally on the way? Have you taken a step of faith and entered through the narrow gate and entered onto the way? Have you been born again? Have you come to commit your life to Jesus Christ? There is no other way to be on the way but that you take a decisive step of faith and repent of your sins and turn away from the world and embrace the Lord Jesus Christ. This puts you on the way. Jesus is the way of salvation. He is the way to the Father. He is the way to heaven. And He is the way to blessing and happiness and joy. That's number one. Jesus is the only way 
to God. There are not two ways. There are not three ways. There's not ten ways. There is only one way, and that is Jesus Christ. When I was a young boy in high school, I had a large poster that hung on the wall of my bedroom. I loved looking at it. I was so proud to put it up in my bedroom. And at the top of the poster, it said, Only one way. And there was a large finger pointing up to heaven. And next to the picture was a representation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And how as a young, as a young man, I, I, I gloried in this truth that Jesus is the only way to the Father and that I was on this way. What a humbling reality this was for me in my life. Now, second, not only is Jesus the only way to the Father, Jesus is the only truth from the Father. He goes on to say, and the truth. I am the way, note, and the truth. That word and is very important, as we've been finding out in our recent studies. This word and means that the way and the truth are inseparably bound together. In other words, you cannot enter the way apart from the truth. The only way that you can access the way is to receive and believe the truth. That is why these are coupled together. The way cannot be entered apart from the truth. And Jesus says here that he is exclusively the teacher and revealer of the truth. Now, someone may say, well, what about the prophets? And what about the apostles? Well, the truth that they spoke was the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Their message did not originate with themselves. Uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Romans 10, verse 17. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. Colossians 3, verse 16. Every word of Scripture is the word of Christ. He is the author of the Bible. Capital A, the primary author. And that is why he is represented in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. Not the feeling. The Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He has come to be the one who is the revealer of the truth from the Father. And what is truth? And that is what Pilate said in mockery to Jesus as he stood before him. What is truth? Truth is reality. Truth is the way things really are. Truth is what is consistent with the mind of Christ, the will of Christ, the character of Christ, the glory of Christ, the being of Christ. And Christ is the author of all truth. He is the source of all truth. He is the determiner of truth. He is the arbitrator of truth. He is the governor of truth. He is the standard of truth. And he is the final judge of all truth. He is the way and the truth. So what does Jesus say about how one enters the way? If you would, turn back to John chapter 3 just for a moment. And I want to draw your attention to one word. One word that is used multiple times. And it is the word believe. What Jesus, who is the truth, says that what is required to enter the way is to believe in him, to believe in the gospel. And in John 3 and verse 14, Jesus is the speaker here. And Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. Please note, it does not say believe and be baptized. It does not say believe and do good works. It does not say believe and become a good person. It does not say believe and 
uh, join a church, attend a church, whatever. If you believe, you will do all of those things. But it is faith alone in Christ that saves and puts one on the way. I believe in verse 16, Jesus remains the speaker. And in verse 16, Jesus said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. He says the same in verse 18. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. What is it to believe in Jesus Christ? It is to believe that you're lost, that you cannot save yourself. It is to believe that Jesus Christ has come into the world to save sinners. It is to come to a place where you recognize this, you confess your sin, and you commit your life entirely to Jesus Christ. It is to come to the end of yourself. It is to surrender your life to Christ. It is to say, I can no longer direct my life. I can no longer be the one who presides over my life. It is to surrender and to submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It is to deny yourself, take up a cross, and begin to follow after Jesus Christ. This is the truth concerning how to enter the way. At the end of John chapter 3, it is made even more clear. Notice, he who believes in the Son has eternal life. There are, there are no other qualifiers to be added to faith alone. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. But he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Please note how believe and obey are used synonymously in parallel fashion. To believe is to obey Jesus Christ. Obedi uh, saving faith is always an act of obedience to God who says, you must submit your life to my Son, Jesus Christ. Unbelief is disobedience. True faith is a step of obedience. And this requirement of faith is repeated throughout John's gospel in so many places. In John 5 and verse 24, it is stated yet again with crystal clear lack of ambiguity. John 5 and verse 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word, no one can be saved unless you hear the word. No one can be saved unless you know the truth. What about people around the world who, who, who die without ever hearing the truth? Do they go to heaven? The answer is no. They must hear the truth. That is why we send missionaries. That is why we publish the gospel far and wide. That is why we translate Bibles into other languages. There is no other way to enter the way except to know the truth. But there must be more than just to hear the truth. Notice he says, Truly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but is passed out of death into life. There it is again. Jesus is the speaker. He is speaking the truth. He is speaking the truth plainly for all to hear, that there must be the full faith in Christ in order to be on the way. Come to John chapter 6, if you would, just for a moment. Just a few more verses to take in. In John chapter 6, in verse 35, Jesus says yet again the same. He says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, 
And he who believes in me will never thirst. Note the parallelism there again. To believe in Christ is to come to Christ. It is to come all the way to Christ. It is to receive Christ. It is to cast yourself upon the mercy of Christ. It is to reach out with arms of faith and to embrace Jesus Christ as one, one's own Savior and Lord. In the same chapter, in John 6, verse 47, Jesus states it now so succinctly. He states it in the simplest of terms, that every one of us here today can understand this. There is no one in this house of worship today who cannot comprehend what is being so simply stated. In verse 47, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. There is no mention of anything else to be added to or augmented to saving faith. That is why we say it is faith alone in Christ alone that saves. While we're still in John 6, look at verse 54. Verse 54 uses a very graphic depiction of saving faith. In verse 54, Jesus said, He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. What does this mean to eat his flesh and to drink his blood? Is Jesus speaking of cannibalism here? Of course not. He's speaking in figurative language. Just as he said earlier in John 7, If any man thirsts, let him come to me and drink. So he is saying here that you must receive me into your life. You must receive me by faith into your soul. Just as you would take food and eat it, just as you would take water and drink it, and make it personal and internalize it within yourself to take it in. Even so, you must receive me into your life. That is what Jesus is so clearly saying. If you would, come to John 8 and verse 24, just to see yet another verse. The Gospel of John has been called the Gospel of Belief or the gospel of faith. And by the way, the words belief and faith are synonymous terms that come from the same Greek word. In John 8, in verse 27, Jesus said, Therefore I said to you, you will die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. This is how imperative it is that we believe in Jesus Christ. If someone lives and dies without believing in Christ, they will die in their sins and they will perish eternally. But if we will believe in Jesus Christ, we will live forever with Him. Now finally, in John chapter 9 and verse 35, this account of the blind man who is given sight and the religious leaders of Israel do not know what to do with him because he once was blind and now he sees. And they ask him, who made you to see? And he kept giving testimony to the Lord Jesus. And in John 9, verse 35, Jesus heard that they, the Jewish leaders, had put him out, meaning de-synagogued him, and finding him, meaning Jesus found this blind man who can now see, Jesus has one question for him. One question of surpassing importance. No other question could be of greater value to this blind man who can now see than this question. It is a question that everyone here today must answer for themselves, must answer personally, the answer to this question will determine your eternal destiny. The answer to this question in your life will determine where you will spend all eternity. It is that important. So he says, Jesus says in verse 
35, he asks the blind man who now sees, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And by the way, the Son of Man is Jesus' favorite term for himself as he has come to identify with lost sinful creatures. Do you believe in the Son of Man? Verse 36, he answered, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and he is the one who is talking with you. And he said, Lord, I believe. There's not a drop of water in this chapter. There's not a Sunday school certificate in this chapter. There's not a a church roll in this chapter. There is not a record of good works in this chapter. The only thing that lost sinful men and women and boys and girls are called upon by Christ to do is simply to believe in Him. To come to the place where they realize that they cannot save themselves, to come to the place where they recognize that they desperately need to be redeemed and to be rescued from the wrath of God that is to come. It is to come to the place of a decisive choice of the will whereby we entrust our soul and our life entirely to Jesus Christ. This is the truth of which Christ makes mention when he says, I am the way and the truth. The only way to enter the way is to hear and believe the truth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Son of Man, who has come to save sinners from their sins. You've heard the truth. You know the truth. Have you believed the truth? Have you believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you come to that place where you actively, decisively, where you stand at a fork in the road and you have to decide which way will I go, that you have stepped out of the darkness, that you step into the light, and you give your life entirely to Jesus Christ? This is the truth as it is represented by Jesus Christ himself. Now, there's a third heading, a third and final heading that I want you to note from John 14, verse 6. We have seen that he is the way and that he is the truth. But there's now a third and final aspect in which Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. This is not a multiple choice. It's not, who here today would like to have one of these three? Who who here today would like to have two of these three? Uh, The word and joins them all together that they are inseparably bound. And what Jesus is saying, as he is the life, that the one who believes the truth will enter the way, and all who are on the way will have the life will know the life, will have the life of God within them. They're not just on a path. They are on a path, which is Christ. But they also have Christ inside of them as they are on the way. They will never travel the way solo. They will never travel the way by themselves. They will always have Jesus Christ himself with them, and more than just with them, they will have him in them. They will have the life within them. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. This third heading is Jesus is the only life in God or from God. Those who receive the truth receive the life. Those who refuse the truth, refuse the life. It's all a package deal. What is the life? Well, please note, first of all, the word the, 
that signifies that there is no other life to have but this life. This is the only life that men and women on this earth may have. Uh, this life refers not to physical life because we have physical life as a result of our physical birth. Uh, this refers to spiritual life that is received only by our spiritual birth. Uh, this life is not to be confused with a mere human existence. This life is eternal life. This life is spiritual life. This life is supernatural life. This life is divine life. This life is the life of God himself in his Son in the soul of a man. John 17, 3 says, This is eternal life, that they may know you and the one true living God who has sent me. Life is to know God. Eternal life is to have God within you, within your soul and to commune with God, and to fellowship with God, and to, work, to walk with God. Without this life, we are spiritually dead. Without this life, we are spiritually empty and hollow and, and have nothing. But all who believe in Christ are made spiritually alive. They know God. They love God. They adore God. They respond to God. This is the life that Jesus has come to give. In these final moments, if you will, turn back to John 1, verse 4. And I want to take you just to a few more verses. I want us to see this thread that is running all through the Gospel of John. There is a thread of saving faith that runs through John's gospel, but so also does the thread of life. In John 1, in verse 4, we read, In him, referring to Jesus Christ, was life, and the life was the light of men. There is no spiritual life outside of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the life, he possesses all life. He is the only giver of spiritual life. In order to have spiritual life, one must know Him. In fact, 1 John 5, verse 12 says, He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. It is that simple. Come to John 3, John chapter 3, where we just were a few moments ago. But faith, or to believe, and life are like railroad tracks that run through the Gospel of John. These two reoccurring themes. And they are laid side by side. And the cause and effect is very clear. That the one who believes in Christ has the life of Christ. In John 3, and if you would notice in, in verse 15, that whoever believes in Him will have eternal life. You see how believe and life are joined together? Look at the next verse. We see the very same, the, the most well-known verse in the entire Bible. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. Believing in Christ and having life in Christ are inseparably bound together. Look at the last verse of John 3, verse 36, which we've already read, but note it now in this context. He who believes in the Son has, present tense, has eternal life. The moment we believe in Jesus Christ, we have eternal life. In John 4 and verse 14, we, we see the same. Whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst, but the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. Eternal life literally means life of the ages to come. It's referring to the life of God in heaven. 
What this is saying, the moment we believe in Christ, the life that we will experience in heaven with God immediately comes to dwell within us. Before we go to heaven, if you will, heaven comes to us. And the life of the ages to come abides in us. And we experience supernatural life while we are living a mere natural existence here upon the earth. And we saw the same in John 5, verse 24, which we have already read. Uh, it seems uh, redundant to read the same verses again, but please notice it now, how believe and life are linked together inseparably. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. There it is again. And the time does not permit us to trace every one of these uh, listings from the Gospel of John, but you can do this on your own as you go home, as you sit in bed, as you sit in the den, and as you're reading your Bible, you can trace this out in John's Gospel. Jesus is the way, the only way to the Father. He is the truth, the only truth from the Father. And He is the life, He is the only life from the Father. No one, He says, comes to the Father but through Him. What an extraordinary, extraordinary statement this is. Je Jesus claims a monopoly on the Father. He claims exclusive passage into relationship with God the Father. That is why it is so important that we know the Lord Jesus Christ. That is why it is so important that we believe in Him. That is why it is so important that we come to the place where we surrender our lives to Jesus Christ or we will never have the life that He has come to give. All of this is of grace, freely provided by God through His Son, Jesus Christ. Let us rejoice that this grace has provided the way to the Father. The Father was under no obligation to make a way to Him for sinful creatures. It was infinite mercy and eternal love on the part of the Father that constructed this way and designed this way that we may come to the Father. Let us rejoice that God has made the way and that He has made known this way to us. There are millions, if not billions, of people in this world who have never heard what you just heard who have never heard of the name of Christ and who have never heard of the truth of salvation. Let us rejoice that God in His mercy has placed us providentially on this globe in a place, perhaps even in a family where this truth has been revealed to you. I had a father who sat on the edge of my bed and read to me the Word of God as a young boy three, four, five, six, seven years of age, a mother who reinforced this. How privileged I am. How privileged you are as well, even this very second, to be hearing the truth regarding the way to the Father. And what a glorious thing it is to have the life within us. You know who is the most miserable person on the earth? It is whoever is in this worship service today who does not have the life. You are enduring this. Religion for you is a boring thing. Coming to church, you may know the truth, you may know about the truth, and you may know about the way, but if you don't have life, then for you, religion is tireless, it is tedious, it is, it is, it is slow motion boredom. But the moment you come to believe in Jesus Christ, it is as though the hallelujah chorus is singing in your ear and the joy of heaven is, being, uh, is flowing from the throne into your very soul. You know joy unspeakable and full of glory. The moment you have this life, 
Do you have this life? Have you been born again? Have you come to the place of total surrender and submission of your life to Jesus Christ? If you will, you will enter into the most glorious, thrilling, exhilarating experience that you will ever know and will ever possibly know, not only in this life, but in the life to come. And it is all found in the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Oh, may we treasure the Lord Jesus. May we love him. May we adore him. He is everything to us. Let us honor him. Let us speak highly of him. Let us sing of him. Let us glory in him. Because he is the way and the truth and the life. And there is no way to God outside of him. There is no truth about God outside of him. And there is no life of God outside of him. If you have him, you have everything. If you do not have him today, you have nothing. Turn to him, believe in him, trust him, submit to him, commit your life to him, adore him, embrace him, receive him. For he is everything.